Critically ill patients are high risk for complications. ICU patients are often bedbound and have multiple invasive lines, tubes, and drains. Further, these patients can be exposed to procedures and medications that have risks and side effects. Common ICU complications include deep venous thrombosis, pulmonary embolus, gastric stress ulcers, bed sores, nosocomial infections, malnutrition, and ICU delirium. Care bundles are groups of evidence-based care components that when executed together may result in better outcomes and prevent high-risk complications. Although the effect of checklists and protocols on patient outcomes is often debated, they can be very useful for learners to remember and organize information. There are several areas amenable to checklists and protocols in critical care. Fast Hug is a mnemonic that helps providers remember to evaluate every day patients' feeding, analgesia, sedation, thromboembolic prophylaxis, head of bed elevation, stress ulcer prophylaxis, and glycemic control. Chang et al. outline nicely other common care protocols, the improved outcomes from the interventions, and the key articles from the literature containing the study data. Landmark ICU studies include decreased mortality with the use of lung protective ventilation in ARDS, reduced in-hospital mortality using early goal-directed therapy for septic shock, decreased length of needed support using spontaneous breathing trials for weaning mechanical ventilation, decreased length of needed support using daily interruption of sedation in mechanically ventilated patients, reduced mortality with restrictive transfusion strategies, improved clinical outcomes using TPA within three hours for ischemic stroke, and improved neurologic outcomes with therapeutic hypothermia after cardiac arrest. Chang's group further points out the potential disadvantages of using protocols in the ICU, which include the use of protocols inappropriately or in the wrong patients, the loss of individualized care, the potential to be obsolete if protocols are not kept current. Protocols may be designed around low quality evidence and protocols may oversimplify ICU care. Because resources vary by institution and healthcare facility, protocols must be adapted to the resources available locally. Three common care bundles associated with decreases in nosocomial infections include ventilator-associated pneumonia, catheter-associated urinary tract infection, and central line-associated bloodstream infection. Examples of these care protocols can be found on the Learning Resource Center, but should be adapted to local resources and standards of care. Stress ulcers are common in ICU patients with major risk factors or more than one minor risk factor. Major risk factors include mechanical ventilation for greater than 48 hours, platelet count less than 50, INR greater than 1.5, a history of GI bleeding within the past year, traumatic brain or spinal cord injury, and burns greater than 35% of total body surface area. Minor risk factors include sepsis, ICU stay greater than one week, occult GI bleeding for greater than six days, glucocorticoid therapy, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, or antiplatelet agents. For patients deemed high risk for stress ulcer formation, proton pump inhibitors or histamine receptor 2 blocking medications should be initiated. Sucrolfate may be substituted if PPI or H2 blockers are not available. In 2000, Kress et al. published a study concluding that medical ICU patients 
receiving continuous infusion sedation were liberated more quickly from mechanical ventilators and left the ICU sooner if they had daily interruption in their sedation and a nurse-driven protocol for sedation management. Providers should use the Richmond Agitation Sedation Scale to assess and target desired levels of sedation. Bedbound patients are at high risk of developing soft tissue and skin injury. Early mobilization and turning protocols can decrease this risk. Bedside nurses must use turning protocols at least every two hours to reposition their patients to avoid bed sores or decubitus ulcers. Questions regarding nutrition in the ICU are common. The 2016 guidelines published by the Society of Critical Care Medicine and the American Society for Parenteral and Enteral Nutrition answered the most common questions for patients in the ICU. When specialized tube feeding solutions are unavailable, providers must know how to calculate the kilocalories and macronutrients of food substances given to their patients. Food kilocalories and macronutrient calculators are easily found online. Some ICU patients are at high risk for developing deep venous thrombosis, or DVT, and pulmonary thromboembolus, or PE. Most patients require pharmacologic prophylaxis using anticoagulation. However, some patients may have a greater risk of bleeding. Each patient's risk must be assessed and appropriate therapy applied. Hyperglycemia leads to higher mortality, higher infection rates, worse neurologic outcomes after traumatic brain injury, and longer hospital stays. However, in the NICE sugar study in 2009, tight glycemic control between 81 to 108 milligrams per deciliter was associated with an increase in 90-day mortality. Therefore, recommended glycemic targets are less than 180 milligrams per deciliter or less than 10 millimoles per liter.